Throughout history and to this day, trains have been a crucial method of transportation for society. One thing many people aren't aware of though, is how train wheels actually behave on the tracks. In this video, we will explore a common phenomenon of trains, namely hunting oscillations. Hunting oscillation is the term used to describe self-oscillation of an object about its equilibrium position. For railroad vehicles, hunting oscillations occur when the wheels move back and forth across the middle of the tracks, seemingly searching or hunting for the equilibrium position. In this video, we can see these oscillations occurring side to side and forward and backward relative to the direction that the train is moving. We might ask, how can we predict the behavior of these oscillations? Could hunting oscillations be responsible for derailment? To attempt to answer these questions, I will use some of the techniques that we have developed in classical mechanics throughout the past semester. Let's start by looking at a basic diagram of a train wheel set. One common misconception is that the train wheels are purely cylindrical and the flanges, which are the notches on the inside of the wheels, are responsible for keeping the wheels on the track. In fact, the wheels are actually slightly sloped with a smaller diameter on the outside of the wheel. When the train turns or the wheels are bumped to one side, the radius of each wheel changes, allowing each of the wheels to work back toward their original position. This geometry is responsible for the existence of these hunting oscillations. For our analysis, we will approximate a single axle of train wheels as a double cone in contact with the rails at two points, with no friction and the initial state of the system being the wheels sitting symmetrically on the tracks. The perturbations will be in the x direction. Here's what this approximation looks like in a vPython simulation. For the scope of this video, we will only be looking at the oscillations of theta, which is in the xz plane in our vPython simulation. Note that the size of the perturbation and angle of the cone are exaggerated so that we can see the oscillations better. Now let's start to go through some of the mathematical analysis. At the start of classical mechanics, we worked on problems with several degrees of freedom and used constraints on our system to remove degrees of freedom to simplify our problem. In this system, our three degrees of freedom are the x and z coordinates of the center of mass of the double cone and the bank angle theta. To constrain the system, we can assume that the mass of the cone will be very large. This assumption means that the cone must be in contact with both rails at all times. This condition also allows us to assume that the z position of the center of mass doesn't change, so we can relate the x position of the center of mass to the angle theta. Now let's use a free body diagram to show the forces on the double cone. The three forces at play here are the two normal forces due to the contact between the double cone and the rails, along with gravity. Newton's second law gives us the equations of motion for the x and z coordinates of the center of mass. Note that our z acceleration of the center of mass is zero. For our rotational equation of motion, we take the cross product of each normal force and the position vector relative to each contact point of the normal force and add them together to get the net torque. Since we have defined this motion in the x, z plane, our resulting torque is in the y direction. Thus, we have our three equations of motion, equations one through three. Next, we will simplify these equations with a few steps. First, we can assume that the perturbations of x and theta are small, so by the Grossman-Hartmann theorem, we can eliminate our trigonometric functions by keeping only the linear order terms of their expansion. In addition, we also make the substitution theta equals negative k x center of mass, where k is equal to tangent of alpha over h. We also notice that the equation of motion for x is included inside the rotational equation of motion, so with these three steps, we end up with equations four through six. In order to obtain a single equation of motion, 
we manipulate equations 4 through 6 as follows. First, we use equation 5 to get equation 4 in terms of only n1, and then solve for n1 to get equation 7. Next, we write equation 6 in terms of n1. And now we plug in equation 7, and we go through a few steps of simplification. Eventually, we are left with equation 8. Since alpha will be very small for a realistic train wheel set, it is easy to see that the term in front of x double prime is positive. Thus, like many systems we have encountered in classical mechanics, this equation of motion resembles the equation for a simple harmonic oscillator. This allows us to conclude that the train wheel system is stable under lateral disturbances. Rearranging this equation, we can see that the frequency of oscillations of this system is given by equation 9. Finally, let's look at a couple limiting cases to check if our solution makes sense. In Mathematica, I've used the limit function on our frequency equation to explore the limiting cases. As the mass of the train approaches zero, the frequency also approaches zero. This makes sense as the decreased mass would lead to a decreased gravitational force to pull the wheels back toward the center of mass. Similarly, if the moment of inertia approaches infinity, which would mean that all the mass is concentrated on the outside of the wheels outside of the tracks, we have the same result of a zero frequency. In vPython, I've used a position update program with the momentum principle using the equation we found for the x acceleration of the center of mass. As we can see, our solution seems to work as a simple harmonic oscillator. And when our mass goes to zero, we also see that the frequency of oscillations goes to zero. From our analysis, we have seen that the hunting oscillations of train wheel sets behave like a simple harmonic oscillator, which means that under small perturbations, the hunting oscillations themselves will likely not cause derailment. This being said, the frequency of oscillations could still damage the load being carried by the train, so it remains important that we control the parameters that affect this frequency in an optimal way. Lastly, I would like to thank B. Shayok for their paper, How Trains Stay on Tracks. This paper was my main source in this project, and you can find a link to it, along with my other sources, in the description below.